And we're back. You're listening to the Talking Boxing with Billy C. Show. Uh, and we'll give a shout out to all of our ESPN New Hampshire listeners. Glad you guys could join us. And uh, I want to mention about my book. <laughs> you know I'm going to. Until, until everyone on the planet has one book on their coffee table and one in their bookshelf, I'm going to keep promoting the book. Tom Molino from Bondage of Baddest Men on the Planet is available right now where all good books are sold. And you can get a copy literally right now by visiting Amazon.com or BarnesandNoble.com. Tom Molino from Bondage to the Baddest Man on the Planet is a great read for everyone, not just boxing fans. Uh, find out uh, why I'm so interested in this guy and why I think that this book will help you help us change the course of history. It's a good book, man. It's, uh, it's, it's there. But right now it's time for... Blast from the Past. We shine the spotlight again on fighters from years past. Joe Frazier with a left hook. Good right hand thrown by Foreman that time. Look at that left that hook. Belt that goes to Ray Van It's Blast from the Past on Talking Boxing. And this week's Blast from the Past, which is being sponsored by KOFantasyBoxing.com. Check it out, www.kofantasyboxing.com. Features a former world champion and boxing hall of famer, Fred Ospitali. And uh, joining me right now to tell us all about my man Fred Ospitali is my man, Alex Papali. What's up, Alex? Good evening, Billy C. How are you? Not too bad. Better than uh, the stream is doing, apparently. Uh, I guess... uh, it's uh, getting some hiccups and everything, but hey. Yeah, um, I, I went in. Uh, I used the force. I, it was six oh one. I said I'm calling because yeah, <laughs> I couldn't hear anything. It was uh, it was froze. Yeah, that's terrible. It's frozen up. I, I can't stand when it does that. But uh, uh, hey, it is what it is. But uh, yeah, Joe was saying it did yesterday too. Well, because I, I was listening to the um, the playback on YouTube and it didn't sound like there was any problems. Um, I, I didn't finish it, but um, I, from I. Well, listen to the first half, and I don't hear any problems. Oh, um, well, you know that uh, maybe streaming live. See, for me, I think even this time of day, anything I'm watching on the interwebs uh, gets hiccups because I kind of get the feeling people get home and they all jump on their devices, it's, and there must be like a, a great suck on the whole system. You know, it's a bottleneck, man, and it's exactly what happens. And and I, I was surprised yesterday we were having some trouble for the first seven minutes. And then it cleared up, you know. But usually, when it gets put back up up on YouTube, um, it's uh, it's all clear, you know. But uh, I, I was uh, noticing that even the playback was a little choppy. The video end was a little choppy uh, yesterday, but the audio was fine. And we always have the audio. the The podcast and the radio stations always get uh, the perfect audio. It's always it's always uh, good. And with the new podcast company. Uh, that we signed up with, uh, we're expecting nothing but good things, so everyone will have that fallback. But anyway, uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Fred Ospitali, this guy was quite the character, huh? Yeah, this guy's a cool guy. Uh, this is um, one of the uh, a guy who you hear a lot about. Um, it's actually uh, Apostoli, Apostoli, uh, Fred Apostoli. I've heard it Apostoli. Um, it's funny. They're actually when you type his name into YouTube. There's some uh, pronunciation company that uses his name as their model. I'll send you the link. Uh, and this guy with a real nice uh, Italian accent says, Fred Apostoli. <laughs> so I guess that's the true pronunciation. <laughs> what, 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 um, but he uh, was born February 2nd, 1913. Alfredo Apostoli um, in, in San Francisco, California. And um, they call him the Boxing Bellhop. Uh, because he took a job um, in his teens uh, working in the hotel, you know, uh, one of those old-style guys there where, uh, you know, he actually was sort of driving the elevator for people um, in a hotel in San Francisco. And um, he started boxing when he was uh, a a wee boy uh, around six. Uh, He used to tell people that it was in an orphanage where he learned to box. You know, it's kind of interesting. I'm not really sure how to describe his style because some places you hear him uh, described as, you know, an outstanding boxer. But in a lot of the fight reports, and there are a couple of videos of him, uh, his win over Freddie Steele, I think, is on is on YouTube. Um, he seems kind of like a brawler, Billy C. I mean, he seems 
definitely a really aggressive guy. Um, middleweight, uh, and uh, what did I give his height? His height is uh, five nine and a half. Although there's some discrepancy about that, uh, sometimes five seven he's reported as. So you know. We yeah. run into that quite a bit. You know, uh, interesting. Uh, I'll add a couple of things to, to the youth, to the youth. Um, yeah, his his mom passed away uh, by the time he was uh, seven years old, and um, his father basically put him in the orphanage uh, by the time he was nine. Uh, they do claim he learned how to fight in the orphanage, but when he got out of the orphanage, he started doing a lot of stuff prior to the uh, bellhop, which he landed his nickname. He worked uh, uh, as a plasterer, a sheet metal worker, a carpenter's helper, a jewelry, uh, jeweler's messenger. And like you uh, alluded to, he started off in the hotel business working the elevators, you know, going up and down. I always think of cartoons when yeah. I think of that, that job. I know, that's, that's the job. <laughs> that's what it was. You know, where, where that's, that was, it was what he was doing. And he, and he got a, a, a promotion to the bellhop. The bellhop was the, the guy that helped people uh, bring their luggage and what have you. And, uh, you know, he ended up uh, getting into a gym. And, and you're right. You know, I, I saw many different uh, uh, things uh, about. The, oh, and by the way, he ends up being a world champion by the time he's 23. So a lot of things happen really quick for, uh, for Freddie. But, uh, but yeah, I, I saw some conflicting things, too. But for the most part, everybody uh, says basically he was extremely skillful. And uh, to uh, back up what you were saying about being a brawler, he was known to have power in both hands and that his hands were pretty fast and he had good footwork. And uh, one of the most important attributes uh, that seems to pop up a lot uh, was the fact that he had tons of heart and a lot of guts. The guy would uh, not be afraid to do pretty much or fight anyone. Yeah, definitely. And he did have um, uh, quite a murderer's role of opponents. Uh, he in very early in his uh, career, his, his seventh fight, he fought uh, tough Freddie Steele. He see. lost that fight by a technical knockout. It was actually his first ten rounds. Well, wait a minute, uh, wait a minute. Before that, how about his pro debut against a 112 fight veteran? He fights. That's his pro <laughs> debut. That was his pro debut. You know, and and you're not kidding. This guy. When you look at those first. Uh, uh, you know, 10, 15 fights. I mean, he was fighting a, a lot of tough guys at a young age. Definitely, yeah, definitely. He, um, yeah, and we're talking in terms of years because what we're going to get to, uh, his, year, his career was actually split by, interrupted, if you will, by the, um, by the Second World War. So he had started as a pro around 1934, very young. Uh, I get a, write an age down here, uh, born in 1913. So, yeah, he was only, what, 21? Um, and very successful right away. Um, he ends up fighting, and uh, he fights Lou Briard, another guy we did a while back. It's been a long time since we did a blast on him, but he was a tough guy uh, that he he defeated. In his 20th um, fight, that was his 20th pro fight, he's fighting uh, a Hall of Famer in Briard. Yeah, he does have, um, he's one of those guys where you look at his career, I think this is where people, uh, why he's a shoe-in for the Hall of Fame, because there's this, it's peppered with Hall of Famers. Um, he uh, fought that guy George Nichols, he knocks him out, uh, one of the last fights of Nichols' career, the recent blast we did. Um, he also, uh, he did move up to light heavyweight and was defeated by the great Billy Kahn, but again, in, in bouts that... You know, he certainly uh, gave quite a good account of himself. Um, you know, this is one of those things. When he won the title, um, he, uh, he beats young Corbett three, And I forget, um, you know, he is one of those guys that uh, it's, you don't see that kind of thing at all. I mean, it's the closest thing we have to that today is a Tyson Fury, where you have sort of a, a name that's an homage to a previous fighter. But to think young Corbett three is like, he's not just the first or second homage to young yeah. Corbett. He's the third. <laughs> I know. But, you know, this, this li here lies some, some, a little bit of controversy uh, about uh, Fred Ospitali. Um, you know, he, he gets credit, um, even in the ring uh, record books, as, as winning... Uh, his first world title in 1937 against Marcel Thill, which was a, a Marcel Thill, which was a guy we did. Thill. Uh, <laughs> Thill, yeah, which we did a, 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 which we did a, a, a blast on. 
but not everyone recognized him. And when he had to fight that famous fight against Freddie Steele, Freddie Steele actually had the title. He had the New York uh, World Middleweight title and refused to put it on the line in 1938 at Madison Square Garden. And it was a, a brutal fight between these two guys. If anybody uh, hasn't seen that fight, I, I, it's up on YouTube. Check that one out. Um, and that fight um, uh, ended in, in uh, uh, Fred's uh, 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 favor. And then he would fight uh, young Corbett III uh, in 1938 for that unification, so to speak, uh, and, and won that one as well. So he did have that title, and he actually did fight Freddie Steele, but Freddie wouldn't put his title on the line. And at the time, FYI, Freddie Steele's record was 120 wins, two losses, and, and 11 draws. Talk about a, an accomplished fight. We should do... Uh, did we ever do a, a... I don't know. I don't think we have done yeah. a Freddie Steele. We should. Yeah. Uh, yeah, some of the notes I have on that, uh, they called it one of the most spectacular and fiercely contested middleweight battles seen here or in any other ring since the good old days. Uh, they said a postally attacked with jungle savagery and a burning thirst for vengeance. Even the crowd wanted the fight stopped. <laughs> so, oh. it, 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 like I said, it's on YouTube. Um, that's a good one. Yeah. Um, yeah. And remember, just like we mentioned, I think, with Nichols, this was another, his fight with Marcel Teal was on that uh, Mike Jacobs uh, Carnival of Champions card. Um, with the uh, Sixto Extabar fight, um, all those other uh, fights we had mentioned um, uh, a couple weeks back. Yeah, he fought uh, a lot of guys. Tony Zale, he came up short against, but uh, Kev Overlin and uh, Seferino Garcia, uh, Molino Patina. I mean, just all, all the names of, uh, of of the great fighters of that era. And like you mentioned, uh, when World War II came a knocking, he went and uh, served his country, and he did fight uh, a couple of times while he was under the service, and he was actually training uh, uh, fighters in the service, but when, when push came to shove, he ended up with a four-year layoff, and when he came back in uh, 1946, um, he did do well. I mean, it's not like he, he lost, but he was never the same fighter uh, uh, again. His biggest win uh, came in uh, uh, 47 against Georgie Abrams, uh, where he won a close 10-round uh, uh, decision. And then, you know, like so many of these fighters uh, from the from these eras, Alex, you know, he fights his last fight uh, and loses and then just walks away at, at a fairly young age. Yeah, he, uh, well, yeah, and like you said, that, that it had been World War II that, uh, um, you know, really interrupted his career. He did come back afterwards, but um, there was, like, a good year um, off there, uh, more than a year, uh, f from 42 all the way to 46. Uh, he, he had that one ex exhibition in there, um, but for the most part, no, work, no real activity. But as so many of these great blasts from the past, uh, guys, we see the guys who are really something else who end up, you know, Hall of Famers, they tend to be um, great characters in life as well. And uh, this, if I could uh, read some of this, although this is definitely would be considered propaganda for the time, I would think. Um, this is a very fascinating piece from August of 43. Um, he, he ended up, from what it sounds like, he's He's in, I guess he is in the Navy, uh, but yeah. he's in the Southwest Pacific Battle Zone. He was a gunner, uh, or on a gun crew, um, gun captain in the Navy. And uh, so here's this piece that they submitted to um, the uh, Washington Post, uh, August 4th, 1943. It, it reads as if it's all, the whole thing was in quotes, as if it was told uh, by red-headed Ensign John Mitchell Quigg, just back from a southwest Pacific battle zone, hunched his 185-pound frame forward and said, Mr., if anybody deserves the Man of the Year in Boxing Award, this year it's Fred Apostoli, who was a gun captain aboard my ship and for his value as a morale builder-upper. His influence on the seamen and the entire task force has been remarkable, and this uplift in spirit has been transmitted to the officers. Apostoli is the chief boxing instructor of the force. In port, he trains the seamen on the forecastle, averaging 50 to a class. He is really selling boxing to the kids. When the ships return from sea duty, a smoker is arranged, each ship contributing talent. 
Fred referees all the bouts and ends up boxing an exhibition. He boxed three Marines in succession one night. The Marines, you know, are rough, tough fellows. One of them got ambitious and was punching for keeps. Apostoli had to drop him to show him who was boss. <laughs> As athletic officer, I had Apostoli under me since he was boxing instructor at Norfolk, Virginia. He wanted action, applied for and got it, and stood up under it better than I can describe to you. The boys have written home to their folks about learning to box from him. I saw a reply from one boy's mother. It concluded, God bless Fred Apostoli. <laughs> yeah. He, uh... So he was really beloved. Uh, you know, by his country too. They, uh, this was sort of the role that um, fighters. I saw uh, James P. Dawson of the Times said that he served a similar role to, as uh, Barney Ross had in uh, in the war as well. Yeah, and and Joe Lewis and and yeah. uh, and Billy Kahn. I mean, all those guys. I mean, I, I, the the whole sports world was was shaken upside down. Um, and, and another interesting fact about. Uh, our, our blast today, uh, Ospitali. Is that my saying? What is it? Ospitali? Osp- Apostoli. 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 Uh, Fred Osp- <laughs> Apostoli. Uh, was, was He was uh, a uh, lifelong friend and went to school with Joe DiMaggio from the Yankees, yeah. uh, which was uh, pretty interesting. One other thing I wanted to mention, just jumping back uh, a little bit here, I forgot, was um, the fight with uh, Freddie Steele in 1938. Um, <clears throat> you know, if you watch it, uh, it's it's a back and forth fight. I mean, you, you, there's no way you're going to say uh, Fred uh, dominated from the beginning. But you would what you will say is that when the fight was stopped in the ninth round, this guy was pummeling uh, uh, Freddie Steele, and, and they they counted over 160 unanswered punches that were landed. By the time the referee decided that he had seen enough. I wonder what these referees that fought, that uh, refereed fights in this era uh, would think of the the fights and how quickly they're stopped uh, in today's sport. Yeah, I know it, it's uh, it's a startling difference. Uh, I'm sure they would think. Although you know, I, one thing I was just thinking about in once I was looking at the uh, the results of the title bout championship boxing game was um, thinking of something that Mike Tyson says about how. Uh, athletes get better they don't get worse and that how much more power is there in a punch today than in apostoles age i wonder has that increased because it does seem that maybe the noggin i don't think can take as much because if you look at the career of like a terry morris i gotta think apostoles took more damage than somebody like a terry terry morris um in terms of punch per punch but maybe the Terry Morrises of the world today, uh, punches are just so much harder. Well, the I, brain just can't take it, you know? I, uh, I, I don't th- know, because athletes are bigger and stronger. I think that fighters of today defensively are better. I, I think the fighters of yesteryear, they, they were great defensively rolling with punches and, and you know, uh, making sure the punch didn't land flush on them uh, by turning their head or rolling with a punch or, or having their mid up uh, uh, just enough to deflect it. But they still took it. They, it still landed and, and caused some type of damage. Today, you see fighters, you know, maybe because the style has changed, they're not so willing to exchange anymore. But I think defensively, and I'm saying, you know, obviously there's some fighters that don't know what the word defense means, but I think collectively defense is, is uh, a little tighter today than, uh, than it was. I, I could be totally wrong. It could be a Mike Silver issue where you're, you're saying, yeah, well, it, wasn't, it doesn't seem as good back then because of all the quality fighters, you know, but... Uh, um, Anyway, one, one thing I do want to add, and maybe you can tell me, because I didn't know how, I know he died at 60, I didn't know of what, but after boxing, he, uh, he did referee for a long time, he owned a restaurant, and uh, I kind of thought, th- this. I, I didn't know how he finished his life uh, financially, because his last job that I found was that he was a salesman for gift items, like a gift item company, and I, and I couldn't help but think of back, like Tom Watt, remember like, Boy Scouts and Cub Scouts, you know, used to sell those Tom Watt, you know, stupid things. And I and I'm thinking, is that what this guy was selling? And if that's the case, it couldn't have been too profitable. I wonder if that's what they were, because what I had was uh, he was he died in his office, 
uh, it was a novelty advertising firm. So I'm not sure what we're talking about. Uh, uh, novelties? Are we talking about like uh, whoopee cushions and fake dog vomit? Yeah, I, don't I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. What they're, kind they're of not novelties? Big, yeah, they're 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 not big high ticket items. You know, I mean, you know, uh, you know, if he if he makes fifty percent on on selling a. Uh, an image of the Statue of Liberty. What's he making? A penny? You know, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I don't know. Did you f- uncover anything of his financial state when he when he passed? No, I didn't. Not I did not see that. And his um, his obituary that was in the Times um, really sticks almost completely to boxing. Um, it does say he was an executive sale. Oh wait a minute. It does say an advertising firm, Mac Newman Inc. But it doesn't say what he did. Um, well, but it was a, a executive sales manager. It doesn't really say what Mac Newman, you know, what they represent. And he he died at sixty, right? Fifty nine. Fifty nine. Um, in his office, he yeah, had November twenty ninth, nineteen seventy three. Um, uh, yeah, and he. I guess the connection with DiMaggio, they were from that same neighborhood, the North Beach section, North Beach section of San Fran. And uh, there were two other guys, Tony Lazzari. And Frank Crozetti, uh, that also went to the Yankees, I guess, from that same uh, neighborhood. Huh. Well, That's pretty weird. Yeah, and uh, and only Big sluggers. And only Joe DiMaggio ended up with Marilyn Monroe, so you know. That's right. <laughs> uh, how do you do in uh, title bout championship computer game? Um, I put him in there, yeah, and I, and I forgot about the Billy Con fights. I should have um, also put him in. Uh, Poor guy uh, <laughs> against Stevenson and Kovalev. No, 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 because you, you already had put him in with Triple G. I'm sure. Exactly. I know he had a, all he could handle with Triple G. Yeah. <laughs> he actually did pretty well. I put him in with uh, Triple G and Canelo uh, against Triple G. Um, the first time they fought, he gets stopped in one round, one seventeen of the first. Triple G wins. Uh, he slammed. You know, Triple G comes out really aggressive throwing loads of punches, he slams him with a right cross, and then caught him with an uppercut, and that uppercut opened a cut that was so bad they had to stop it. I put them in against each other 100 times, and their apostoly does far, far better. He actually does get the better of Triple G. Uh, 52 wins, 43 defeats, 5 draws, 29 of his wins over Triple G by knockout. Of Triple G's 43 victories, he gets 35 stoppages. So I did think that, um, you know, that was, uh, he definitely did fares pretty well against uh, Triple G. He fared even better against uh, Cinnamon, uh, against Sa- Saul Alvarez the first time they fight. Um, it was a pretty nip and tuck into that final uh, 12th round. Um, Apostoli won the first four, four, four rounds. Alvarez wins the fifth through the eighth. Apostoli picks up the ninth and 10. Uh, Cinnamon wins the 11th. And then, just to solidify things, Apostoli drops him in the last round to win a unanimous decision, 115-114, 115-112, and 114-113, all to Freddie Fred Apostoli. Uh, and um, when they fight 100 times, he dominates Canelo. 85 victories, 12 defeats, Three draws. He stops Cinnamon 41 times, and of uh, Canelo's 12 victories, he did score eight knockouts. Yeah, I was surprised that uh, Triple G knocked him out so quick. I mean, he wasn't. He had a good set of whiskers. I mean, uh, he lost 10 times in his career being stopped four, uh, which uh, you know, uh, some a couple of those were TKOs as well. Uh, be- yeah, I cuts. think sometimes the game throws things like that little wrinkles on you at you because. When they fight a hundred times, you know it's usually a possibly winning by just knockout. You know, and so. one one thing I want to add is when he did uh, come back from his uh, uh, layoff in the service, he he only fought fifteen more times in his career, and he fared pretty well. Thirteen wins, five coming by knockout, and uh, lost only twice with one stoppage uh, at the hands of uh, uh, Bobby Volk, who was an eleven and one fighter. Uh, in 1947, uh, Fred uh, Apostoli uh, had a career record of 61 wins, 31 coming by knockout. He had 10 losses, like I mentioned, with four uh, of those coming by stoppage. He had one draw. He had a uh, knockout percentage of uh, approximately 43%, uh, 72 total fights, 551 rounds. 
was uh, inducted into the Init International Boxing Hall of Fame in 2003. He was a former world middleweight champion. And uh, I don't think he – did he challenge uh, for the uh, light heavyweight? Uh, I think uh, I don't think he I, fought for the title. Yeah, no, I don't think but I it think was. he had. I think that's what 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 I lost track of because I scanned his uh, his bout. Uh, I mean his uh, record, and I missed the Billy Conn fights because I think they were they were very. They Conn was only like three years into his career, so I think there were like ten round non title title bouts. Yeah, he, he did get. Uh, uh, he did have some trouble making weight. Um, and he thought he could fare better at the light heavyweight division, but facing back-to-back -back fights against Billy Kahn, he decided mm, maybe he's in the right division. Yeah, that's enough. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's enough experiment. But, uh, Alex, stick around. Uh, great job, as, as usual, with the blast. Uh, we're going to take a short break, and when I come back, uh, i got some other issues uh, and questions.